All right. Hello, everyone. We will give you a couple minutes to come in. Not a couple minutes, probably like a minute. It just always seems longer. We've got a couple in right now. Um, in the chat, I have added uh, the links for today's webinar in a Google Doc. You are welcome to access that at any point. Um, if you would like to, please go ahead, tell us where you're from, how you're doing, say hi to everybody that's in the group. We've got a good panel today. And you guys too on the panel, you're welcome to type in and say hi and where you're from if you want. Which, which side of St. Louis, though? I, didn't, I never asked. I'm on the Illinois side, so I am about 20 minutes east of St. Louis. Oh. Yeah, good question. All right, hello, hello. We've got Oklahoma City, Arkansas, Tony's. Illinois. I mean, Illinois, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Ohio, Ohio, very nice. Okay, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, you are, if you didn't know, in the UB Tech Education webinar, Perspectives on Teaching Robotics and STEM. If you would like to connect with us, you can find um, our social media platforms as UB Tech EDU, so you can find us all over the place there. Our website's on the screen, ubtecheducation.com. You can also reach out to us at info at ubtechducation.com. Please know this will be recorded. You will receive a link to the recording following this, I think, within 24 hours. Um, and then you will also get a survey following the live event. Um, if you could fill out that survey, we'd appreciate it. Um, we would love any feedback you have for us so that we can make these better and improve upon them each time. Our agenda today is super short. We're gonna do some guest introductions. As you can see, I have got some lovely gentlemen with me today that are not rusty. So we've got some new faces for you. Um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, UB Tech and UB Tech Education, just a couple slides there. And then we're kind of changing up um, how we do things this time. We are doing a roundtable discussion. So how this is gonna work is I'm going to ask one question for each of the guys to answer together. Then they're each gonna have a separate question to answer. And then we're gonna come back to another full question where everyone's going to answer. So I'm not going to be really pulling questions from the chat during this time, just because I want them to focus on the question at hand. But you are welcome to put in questions in the chat or in the Q&A part, um, and we will save those for the very end. So after I ask them all these questions, we will do another Q&A. So anything you want to ask these guys, please feel free to throw in the chat or the question and answer section. And then we'll do our Q&A, as I mentioned. And then I'll tell you about next month's webinar because it is also a little bit different. So to get started, who are we? Normally I have Rusty with me. He's actually at a school today doing a workshop. So we do not have Rusty, um, but my name is Christina Davis. I'm the educational specialist here at UB Tech Education. There is my email address, Twitter and LinkedIn. You're welcome to follow me, um, tag me, whatever you wanna do. I love seeing what you guys are doing in the classroom. And then Mr. Brian Wetzel, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Wetzel, as it says. I'm a 17, just finished up my 17th year of education or finishing up. Um, I have taught math classes and the first part of my career, and now I'm more of a STEM-based teacher with a wide range of curriculum that we'll get into later. Uh, I teach at Centerburg High School, which is just outside of uh, Columbus. Uh, Centerburg is about northeast or northeast of uh, Columbus. Um, real close to the, the big Intel project, if you've heard about that in the news. Um, I live about, I actually live about 10 minutes from where they're putting that um, huge uh, microchip factory up. As far as in the classroom, I like to uh, incorporate a lot of project-based learning. Um, I do a variety of projects uh, in all of my classes. Um, I believe it's a little bit more personable when the, the students uh, come upon the learning themselves. So I'm much of a provide the resource and then uh, give them some time to look at it uh, before just lecturing about it. So, um, but yeah, uh, that's me in a nutshell. You can follow me in here. Uh, usually Mr. Wetzel Ed Tech and then uh, my emails right there as well. Awesome. And I forgot to mention, I think in our, um, the webinar link stock, we also have links to their um, or their names for their Twitter accounts and also links to their email. So you guys can reach out to them after or during this webinar as well. So 
Thank you, Brian. Our next guest speaker, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Paul. I've been in education for about 25 years, but my uh, career in the uh, working world started out as uh, nuclear engineering. Uh, but I liked coaching kids because I've been coaching since I was 18. Um, so I shifted to education and I've been doing physics and math um, since then. A little bit at the community college, mostly at the high school, a little bit at middle school. Um, before going to nuclear, I was a computer science engineer. So the coding and robotics are just something I've been a part of forever, just like a natural extension of uh, things to do. So I'm always geeky about um, coding, robotics. I'm geeky about all sorts of stuff. I mean, when they said, you know, this week that they're going to uh, discontinue the iPod, it's like, I remember the first one. Yes. I mean, I was always into trying gadgets in the classroom. You know, what can we buy that kids can use to learn with, to create with, to design that's going to make this much more interesting? Um, I've left the classroom and I am extremely, I left the classroom to explore maker-centered learning and maker spaces more than I was already doing. So I was able to get to conferences and now I wanna coach people. I wanna coach teachers and schools about how to do maker spaces right, how to do maker-centered learning right. Um, there's just not quite that job out there for it yet is the hard part, so. Hey, but you it. could make it, right? <laughs> I'm trying, but it's, it's tough. In the, in the pandemic, the past couple of years, no one wanted to do anything different. I don't blame them. Right. So this is different. <laughs> we will get there. All right. And last but not least, Lauren, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Warren Wise. Um, uh, I guess you can see I'm a been teaching for close to uh, 18 years now. Um, I'm an actual middle school science teacher here at Kelly Mill Med Pro Middle School here in South Carolina. I actually also teach um, STEM classes as well. Um, I was voted the, um, the South Carolina STEM Educator Year in 2019 and actually a presidential award uh, um, finalist, state finalist here and a PBS Digital um, Innovator. Uh, basically, all that sums up. I've been busy the last couple of years doing a lot of STEM stuff, lots and lots. That's just me. Um, you know, I always try to tell my students, you know, um, you should always come better than you were yesterday. Just keep improving yourself. And um, to tell you a little bit about myself before we go into our segment, um, a former um, uh, chemical operations specialist from the uh, Army Reserves, uh, did it for eight years. I went to the CDC for training and to actually teach teachers how to do um, and conduct um, actual experiments and projects dealing with um, pathogens. And it's amazing how the last two years, the stuff I went to school with, you know, transcended what we, what's going on now. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, I enjoy science, I enjoy STEM. Uh, I like to do uh, the same thing, similar to what Brian and Paul do, uh, do a lot of project-based learning and to uh, actually train teachers as well. Uh, I think this segment here is gonna be a great segment that everybody's gonna enjoy. You're gonna get a lot from it from all three of our perspectives. And, uh, and uh, let's get to it. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, Warren. <laughs> all right, before we get into the questions, just a little bit in case you're new to us about UB Tech and UB Tech education. So UB Tech Ro uh, Robotics, if I can talk, is our parent company. Um, they're a world leader in robotics and AI, building all of these fantastic robots you see in front of you. So we've got Cruiser on the left, which is um, a hospitality robot. And then we've got um, Addybot in the middle, which is our UBC disinfecting robot. And then Walker on the right is just fun. So if you've ever seen videos of him, uh, he's out at CES every year and uh, likes to pour soda and do all sorts of fun things. So um, really fantastic robots. And then we take that knowledge um, in that robotics and we put it into education. And so UB Tech Education is a division of UB Tech Robotics. And we really focus on giving kids some hands-on engineering and coding and all of that stuff that goes in with that to build up those 21st century skills, computational skills, uh, social skills, right? We want them to be able to work together in teams. And so just anything we can do to make it fun, make it hands-on and make it interesting. 
Okay, before we go in, because I think this is going to be our first question next, before we go in, we've had quite a few people join us, so hello, those that are here now. Uh, just giving you a heads up, this is going to be a little different webinar. We're going to do a roundtable discussion, so I'm going to ask five questions to the gentlemen that are with me today, and as they answer the questions, if you come up with more questions you'd like to ask or you'd like to, them to expand on, please go ahead and put those in the chat or put them in the question and answer section, and we will address those after everyone has answered all their questions. So we're going to go through five slides here and then a Q and A at the end, but please make sure you ask questions. Um, and then if you have not yet checked our, our Google Doc, please do that. We've got contact information for all the guys. There are webinar links in there for upcoming webinars. Uh, we've got website links. We've got um, the guys each put in their perspectives on STEM and teaching. And um, there are some fun links in there as well of all sorts of things that you can check out. So please make sure you look at that. If you have uh, do not have access to that, let me know and I will get it put back in the chat. So. Moving on, here we go. So this first question is gonna be posed to each of the guys on the call. So um, I'll just go down my list as I see you guys on the screen, if that's all right. So the question is, why should you use robotics and STEM in your classroom? So Mr. Brian Wetzel, could you answer first, please? Oh, you're muted, Brian. I am. So there we go. All right. Um, so uh, when it comes to robotics, uh, as much as they have been integrated in our society, I think we, uh, I think we realize how much of a bigger part of society they're going to become. Um, one of my monikers that I use uh, in my classroom is making the future now. So you know we're trying to integrate as much stuff in our classrooms today um, for our students who are going to be entering the workforce tomorrow. And obviously tomorrow, you know, could be, you know, literally tomorrow with some of our seniors and tomorrow could be, you know, four years down the road with, with our freshmen. So um, we're always trying to prepare them, uh, you know, for, for what comes next after high school. And, and I, I think the, the writings on the wall that robotics are going to be a, a part of that. Plus, you know, it's a good creative uh, problem solving approach to you know, seeing things and getting an immediate response, you know, coding and getting an immediate response, um, whether right or wrong or indifferent, you know, whether when things need touched up, when things need corrected. Um, it, it's just, like I said, a, a number of important day-to-day -day skills, but, you know, ultimately, like I said, it's, it's about tomorrow. Absolutely. And getting that immediate feedback is always great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. All right. Thank you, Paul. What would you like to add to that or a different perspective on using robotics in STEM? I have a saying that the world is a STEM maker lab just waiting for us to explore it. And our classroom should be the world, you know, not just the room. So it's all there. It's so prevalent, whether it be STEM or robotics. I mean, an automatically opening door, that's coding and robotics. And that's a simple thing that, that can be recreated in the classroom. Um, so kids need lots of experience and lots of um, interacting and creating with all these things. And I, and I believe that STEM, coding, robotics, uh, making are, are great avenues for leading with curiosity. Because I think that's the first C of learning. Uh, the, all the other Cs come from curiosity. And I think uh, those ideas, uh, STEM, coding, robotics, making, are about letting kids be curious and going from there. Very good, very good. I agree, I like that. I've never had someone say one of the one of the C's is curiosity. So I will add that into my vocabulary now. The first C. <laughs> I love it. All right, Mr. Warren Wise, what do you have to add about robotics and STEM in the classroom? Uh, basically, uh, if you wanna impact the child's uh, life itself, use some form of STEM education in within any classroom. It doesn't matter whether it's ELA, um, social studies, Spanish, you know, science and math are going to be there, but to make a, um, to impact a child so they can actually say, hey, we did something like that in the classroom, use some form of, um, like we're doing now, like robotics, uh, something dealing with these uh, STEM in nature, some type of science, some type of technology, engineering, math, you're going to go ahead and put that in there, your, your students, um will expand from that they're going to grow from that they just like paul just said their curiosity is going to grow 
And the more and more they get curious about wanting to learn about that subject, um, just like, you know, the State Department says, you know, test scores to go, you know, that's what they want, right? They want to uh, show that in a child and the child is going to grow from there. They're going to want to be in that classroom because the ELA teacher used X, Y, and Z in their classroom, meaning something that I have right behind me. The social studies teacher, it doesn't even have to be this actual type of uh, robotic equipment, but it could be some type of STEM activity that will impact them and make them remember and trigger those, those uh, memories right there. And, it, it, and it's going to inspire that child to do more within that classroom. Uh, and that's one of the main things that you want to um, try to use uh, in your classroom, no matter which classroom you are. Everybody can be a STEM teacher. You do not have to have a science or math degree to be that. Everyone can be a STEM teacher. I completely agree. And it's so um, it's so cool to see the light bulb come on, right, when they're doing hands-on activities because they're making all those connections as opposed to just listening, right? It's really hard to retain anything when you're just listening on and on or, you know, taking notes. But hands-on, I love that. Very good. Okay, we are now going to go into individual questions. So Paul's going to start us off. His question is, what connections have you made for students to connect to robotics in a real world way? We have coded music with a program called Sonic Pi. We've used robotics kits to uh, make dragsters, to make um, stoplights, and they had to sequence stoplights. We've taken an Edison, little Edison robot and tried to turn it into an ice cream truck where it would drive along and it would play uh, an ice cream truck song, whatever that would be. Uh, so they could code, they coded music in that also. And we wanted it to pull over when it had clap detection. We had, we had a little bit of trouble with that. We couldn't quite get it to work right, right on that. Um, but then I know some colleagues, they've had students do some artwork. They've integrated uh, coding robotics with artwork, but they took a fam famous painting and the kids would recreate that famous painting in whatever medium they wanted to use. But part of it, they had to make 3D uh, incorporating some physical computing. Uh, some code, some coding and robotics, whether it's servos and sensors and lights and sound, um, to to animate the the uh, the rec recreation of the painting. I know others who've done a lot of uh, just animating scenes from stories and books to make the book and the story uh, come alive, so kids could talk more about the story and the part that they found most interesting. One uh, teacher I knew had uh, like sixth graders work with second graders and the story that they were that the second graders were reading and the sixth graders animated the story <clears throat> part of the story with the second graders so it was a nice little uh cooperative learning thing going on there um the second graders learning from the from the fifth sixth graders um so things like that i see the animation of you know physical computing with you know stories and themes from stories is great uh, great way to, to uh, cross curricular, trans curricular. Absolutely. I, I always try to encourage when I uh, do workshops and stuff, I think ELA is a super easy connection to robots, right? Any story you read, you could say, hey, I need you to build something that represents the beginning of the story or the main character of the story or, or the background of the story, right? I think there's always good ways that you can illustrate and animate, like you said, like that really tie in easy for for ELA. So that's great. Thank you, Paul. All right, next we have Brian up and Brian's question is, how do you connect robotics or you kits if you wanna get specific to the content you cover in your classroom? So when it comes to my uh, classrooms, uh, once again, I, I host a, a wide range of uh, STEM classes, STEM-based classes, both uh, you know, the creative aspect of it and the more technical side of it. When it, I, I think I just try to integrate it to like, just to, just to bring in the coding into the different classes that I have. So with my, with my AP uh, class, you know, one thing that we did was we've been working with Swift all year round. Um, all the way up, you know, as, as the base of my language for my computer science principles. And so now it's 
once we now that we're past that that AP test, you know, it's time to break out the robotics kits um, to transfer those skills that we learned in Swift with functions and abstraction and stuff, um, and and bring it over to UCode and the UKits uh, to to see how you know the connections between them and uh, how those types of skills, even though you're doing something in a completely different language, uh, in a completely different form, because UCode's largely block based, we those skills still transfer over. Um, I also use them in uh, some of my other classes. I have a general computer class. Uh, I have an engineering class. Uh, the engineering class I just got done with a, a good unit with them. Uh, we were, I brought it into manufacturing and engineering through that way. Uh, you know, I actually did a, a manufacturing uh, research project over the summer and it, it was fun in that respect to, to see how many different careers are involved in the manufacturing world and how robotics have, have played a part in, in a lot of that. So in my engineering class, we studied a lot about manufacturing as well. And, you know, for with the U kits, they modeled a, a robot that could be used in a factory or a manufacturing environment. Um, and, and, and some, and what was nice, you know, speaking on that uh, curiosity that we mentioned uh, earlier, I started them all off on the, the same robot just to kind of give them the all kind of the same ground base of knowledge. But then as a follow up, like I said, within the uh, manufacturing factory environment, they were were able to build their own robot. So they picked they either a picked one uh, from the plethora of available builds. Um, some of them took those builds a step further and tried to integrate an improvement to it or an extra functionality to it. Um, I had one group literally build an entire robot from scratch um, that had you know the the tank tracks um, with a third gear in there that you know, none of the other tutorials really explored. Um, so just giving them that that little bit and letting them take it where they wanted to go. Um, and obviously problem solving along the way, which once again, I, you know, cover in a lot of different forms. Uh, it's, you know, it, giving them that availability to just roll with it and apply it to real world stuff that, you know, I try to cover in my classes. Um, you know, those real world skills, whether, you know, it, it, once again, dealing with the stuff of today or dealing with stuff of tomorrow, those ideas that, you know, are going to have to carry forward and transition and, you know, transfer skills from, you know, this context to another context. Um, that's what I really try to focus on. And, and like I said, these robotics and these UKIT specifically gives us the ability to do that very well. Perfect. And that's kind of the beauty, isn't it, of using robotics for those that that are OK with just kind of the freedom of letting them explore and letting them expand on whatever they're doing. I mean, it doesn't have to be like the prescribed lesson with a robot. You can just branch out into whatever way the kids want to go. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I have to ask, when you did your manufacturing stuff, did you watch a lot of how it's made? <laughs> no. I love those videos. <laughs> uh, no, but. It's funny because uh, after the fact, uh, I thought about doing that as a, a good way to introduce that idea. And I, I wish I thought about it at the beginning, but you know, just to get them in that mindset of how different things are made from you know incredibly complex assembly line robotic procedures. And and when I covered that, it, it was definitely in part of my reflection of. Uh, you know, what could I do to introduce this differently or, or how could I bring this uh, a little bit more real to them and, and things that they like and how it's made was really, it just jumped at me. And once again, I, I was already knee deep in the lesson, but. That's always how it works, right? I just, anytime I think manufacturing, I'm like, I always learn something new from that show. Like there's a whole piece of equipment or robot or something that I didn't even know existed. And then you watch that show and you're like, that's how it's done, right? Yep. That's how it's made. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Brian. All right, Warren, what impactful moments has robotics had on your students and, a community, uh, and your community as a whole? 
Well, uh, to, to start off, um, basically I teach sixth grade science. And, and during the year, I always tell my students that we do not do science projects here. We do research projects. That's the main thing. We, you know, I want them to get in their mind. I tell the parents, first part of the year, do not come here thinking you're doing a science project, you're doing a research project. There are more research jobs out there than there are, you say, science project jobs. Okay, I don't, I don't know what science project jobs you can get. I have no idea. All right, <laughs> but, but you get a lot of research. So uh, basically, um, about two, going on two years ago now, um, we've been participating on three years now. Now I think about it, we've been participating in a program called eCyber Mission, and it's a national um, uh, program in which students can put in and actually conduct research projects and actually get into a competition. Well, our first, our first go at it was three years ago. And basically what we did during, during that time period, I had uh, my sixth graders um, actually create um, these small little uh, vehicles that you get from the U kids and actually uh, see how they perform on different terrains as if they were a Mars rover. Okay, if you can remember the Mars rover was, uh, that was a big thing a few years ago. So the students were actually change the terrain. They, were, they had, uh, and they kind of tore my classroom. This is my classroom. This is the actual classroom they were in. And uh, we had the tables filled with sand on one table. We had a uh, bubble wrap on another table. Uh, we had a um, uh, little artificial grass or turf on another table. Uh, it was different tables um, in which the terrain of the, uh, the robots were being used. Well, it's easy enough to actually build it and, and actually program, let them zoom on off. Well, how do you actually do the research? Well, I had to combine some stuff, all right? I had to make sure that I was not just having fun in class because my, you know, my administrators want to make sure I'm still teaching my lesson, right? So I said, okay, what we're going to do is uh, combine some of our um, uh, other products that we get, you know, we use in the classroom veneer, you know, which is a great company where you can, they do a lot of research with. Well, we connect it with our robots that we have. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about something that was fun and, and I mean, yeah, it tore up my classroom. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of cleanup during that time, but it was worth it because the thing that happened for the first time in South Carolina, we had a um, all female African-American team to actually win a, uh, a state competition in that. They, they never had that before. And so um, they, got a, they got a scholarship at sixth graders, you know, uh, $500 scholarship waiting for them um, when they uh, get out of high school. The year after that, uh, we had, we won the state competition where we had four of them, um, uh, boys and girls, they won first place in creating a um, sanitation, uh, mass sanitation device. It was all robot everything. It was, um, we had to be at home. We had two kids actually do the, the Petri dishes and everything at home with the mask. And the other two were actually building a robot and they met up together to actually enter that and they won first place. So uh, in the last couple of years, we've um, just for six and seven graders, we've given out, given out well, excuse me, I won't say us, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, competition, uh, eCyber Mission, um, has uh, been awarded over $10,000 worth of scholarship just for middle school students. So I've had a lot of the parents get mad because their child can't get in my class. I'm not the best teacher in the world, but I love to show them that if you do this type of research, man, yeah, uh, it will impact that child. It, they will become curious. They, those girls had bragging rights you know, for a couple of months there because no one ever did that. And so, and uh, what I did was just add uh, these U kids here. It, it made the learning curve a whole lot easier. Yes, you can get a car from your local toy store or something like that. I'm not saying just use this. It was just, I had the opportunity to do it because I got to add programming with it. And we used the, like I said, some other products to help um, make sure that I got the lesson at hand that, that we had to do. We were talking about force and motion. All right, we we're talking about uh, simple machines with pulleys. All right, this is one of the things we had right here. Okay, 
This was made out of PVC pipe and wood and some dolly. It's just, it's and a pencil. This pencil is all tore up to try to get in there, but that's all I got. You know, and that's that's it. This is a inclined plane. And we had the small little cars to go up this. So the students were actually getting to measure this stuff. So I, I let them see the real world activity just by doing these small little things. Uh, instead of me going out and buying, I think if we got something like this from, you know, some science store online or somewhere, it, I think it was close to $200. This right here was uh, 20 bucks. And I got like four or five of them sitting in the classroom. Okay. Um, and so that was, that was it. It was, it, it made an impactful moment, you know, um, more and more people got, you know, wanted to get involved. And I got a chance to actually show the teachers how they can actually do it uh, in their classroom. They don't have to program. We just, we just started to build a trend. And um, so far as, so far as working, I, like I said, I'm not the best in the world and I cannot do it myself. I would never say that. I have to piggyback on other teachers. I need their help and make sure we get that squared away. But um, so far, so good. Uh, we're good to go when it comes to these things. I think that's always like, um, I think it's a big hurdle for some teachers, but branching out and getting other teachers involved or getting community members involved or, you know, asking for donations or anything to help with, right? Like, you, like you said, you don't need to have a certain robot or a certain kit. You just need to be able to find the resources. That's, that's it. We, we could not do it, uh, the whole thing and not basically, you know, a, a, a teacher who's been teaching for 20 years has never seen a robot. They were teaching when chalkboard was there. They don't want to deal with this. They don't want to deal with that. So we have to, we have to you know, spoon feed them a little bit. You got, I don't even want to show them this either because they'll probably break it. I, you know, I'm like, no, no, let's do something simple and uh, we'll go from there. It still can be STEM. It still can be STEM related. All right. But let's let's uh, break it down a little bit right there. And that's that's what we're doing over here to try to make those uh, impactful moments itself. Very cool. Very cool. All right, everyone on the call, we are getting to our last question um, that all of the guys are going to answer. So if you have any questions for them that you would like them to address um, after that question, please get those in the chat or in the Q&A. So last roundtable question. So since time is a valuable and scarce resource for teachers, how did you add robotics into your daily lessons with the small amount of time provided? So I'm going to go backwards. So I'm going to start with Warren this time, but how are you fitting robotics in and STEM in, in the time that you have in the classroom? Man, <laughs> all right. In the beginning, um, it, it was tough because uh, you have to juggle so many things. And yes, uh, the administration always wants test scores. Everybody wants test scores, test scores, you got to follow this pacing guide. You got to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, so what what I uh, came up with, um, with the help of a couple other teachers, is that we had our robotics team um, to actually do some of the projects, you know, after school. And they were actually asked other teachers, um, you know, what is it that they need or what is it that they're studying, uh, teaching in, in the classes. And so, um, uh, when the teacher says, hey, we're reading a book about such and such horse or such and such mouse, they would actually create, um, the kids would come back and create a, a mouse or a vehicle and dress it up like a mouse, but that's the art part of it. You use steam in that. Make a little, we got a couple of pictures I wish I could show y'all, but um, they dress it up like that and they would go back in the classroom and have the teachers use it in stations. Uh, an ELA teacher itself was talking about um, smart homes, sort of like the Jetsons, you know, how George Jetson would wake up and the, the robot would put on the clothes, brush the teeth, feed them and stuff. Well, we, we definitely couldn't do the smart home like that fully, but uh, the teacher said, hey, can you make a robot where it would brush or comb the uh, person's hair? So the student, and that's an easy one in the UKIP, the, uh, the claw, and so the students will actually do that the teacher doesn't have to worry about programming. Don't have, they don't have to worry about um, uh, actually building it. The students will go back and build it in a couple of days, give it to the teacher, and the teacher can use that as a demonstration or as a station. As you can see in this classroom, my classroom is still, you know, has the, the COVID, you know, uh, barriers up, and we have them in station still. I, it's easy for me to do that. So it, it worked. So that saved a lot of time. I'm used to it. 
I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a STEM teacher. My degree is in physics. I got a chemical uh, background from the military. I mean, uh, I, I do web design and computers and stuff also. Um, I, I, I can do that, all right? Not everyone else can do that. So what I try to do is eliminate those things that they don't have to worry about, okay? And that's, that's what we did here at uh, Kelly Mill Med Pro Middle School. And so far, I mean, COVID kind of, hit us a little bit, um, but we did a little pockets of it this year because we're getting out of that fold, thank, thank goodness. And uh, next year we're full blown back into our robotics team and going back into the different classrooms and everything. Very cool. So for those on the call, I mean, if you've got a STEM class or club or robotics club, that would be awesome to just ask, have them go around and ask the teachers, hey, what can we build for you that you could then use in your classroom? I think that's fantastic because then that that takes that barrier away, right? For that teacher of having to learn how to use the kit right away. They can just use the robot. Very yeah, cool. They, they use it as a business too. Uh, Cause yeah. they actually have a business uh, magnet here and they have order forms that they have to fill out. So that's really good for them to learn a business. And they have to be professional too when they do that. <laughs> I love that. Look at all those life skills they're getting. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, Paul, same question to you. When you were in the classroom, how did you squeeze all this stuff in with everything else you had to do? Oh, you got to unmute. <laughs> I know it's hard. I don't have you guys mute usually, huh? <laughs> you can't get everything in. That's the hardest part of teaching. And teachers have to come to that realization. They're never going to get everything done. So what's the, the important stuff to, to get in there that they've got to uh come to the realization and part of it is um allowing kids to be doing different things um some people have gone with the idea of choice boards and you know that was always something i i kind of did that that there were options in the assignment you could do you, to to show me you know something you could do this 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 or this mm -hmm. or if you can come up with something else let me know um but coding and robotics is you know one of those choices of how to show me you can do something. Uh, a recent example was all the kids had to design snowflakes. I just wanted them to get the idea of you know creating and designing, but also understanding the science, the chemistry um, of snowflakes. And we can have discussions about uh, freezing points and melting points and crystals and hexagons because snowflakes are hexagons. Snowflakes have six fold symmetry. Don't make a four, a four, a four pronged snowflake and call it a snowflake. It's not. Um, so I had to make it out of anything. And I had kids using like perfume bottles. Well, as long as you got six, you can do it. Um, silverware, but coating was an option. And there were several different coating options there that they could do um, for the kids that wanted to. So, you know, give, giving the kids a choice uh, and having that be an option. And it, you know, it's hard as a teacher. It's easy for me. You know, like, like Warren, Warren said, it, it's easy for us because we're STEM, we're chemistry, we're physics, we're code. We already know this. Um, and that's, it, it, we've understood giving up some control to the kids, letting kids have, having a choice and voice. Um, we've gotten comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, having the as Warren said, his room was was a mess. Yet yeah, we've gotten comfortable with that. You know, I've had teachers walk by my room, and said, "Oh my God, how could you even be in here?" It works. <laughs> that's you know, that's it's it's a whole different mentality. Um, I stopped having janitors clean my room because they they wanted to put everything in nice, neat rows. I'm like, no, no, that doesn't work. We'll clean it. <laughs> Just that, you know, I get my own mop and, and, and broom. We'll clean. That's our job. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll move everything around, sweep, and put everything back the way we want it. You know, yeah, that's the thing. Giving up the control and getting comfortable uh, being uncomfortable and giving kids choices. It's, it's such a different mindset, isn't it? And I always made sure as a teacher that the janitor was one of the people I was best friends with. So that when I had glitter all over the place, he was like, hey, it's cool. We'll vacuum it up at some point, you know, like. You just have to make friends, but yes, you do. I love the choice option. And, and Paul, you're always great. Um, and you've done it in the chat too, is 
offering extensions, right? You have kids that always finish early. Have robotics be an extension, have it be an option that they can do later or, or in their presentations, their projects. I love that. Like what an easy way, if nothing else, right? Hey, I want you to do this. Here are your options for how you can do it. That's like probably the easiest way you could start getting started with all this stuff, right? It, and like, yeah, I mean, getting, if you got something new, that's always the, the great thing of give it to a kid. I, I don't know how to use this. Can you show me, how, can you figure this out for me? Show they me how to do this. Right. Because there, it's the, again, it's that leading with curiosity. Mm -hmm. I have a, a friend who does international speaking, and it was way back in the, the 80s where there was that um, dome thing that was a uh, did math and it would do math problems, the, the digi key or digi calculator or something like that. Yeah. And it was new. And uh, he reported back to the to the teacher, well, it's only like 95% accurate. <laughs> the teacher kind of looked at him and he figured out later that he the person was only 95 percent accurate the digi key was 100 percent accurate very nice very nice yeah it's okay to not know right the kids will figure it out or you'll figure it out together it's okay to not have the answer right away for sure all right brian last but not least how do you sneak robotics and stem and all of this stuff into your daily lessons so one of the first ways that i did it um in, in one of my classes i had a few robotics because I had a few spheros. I had um, one, one of the uh, more basic uh, GMU uh, UB Tech kits. And in, in that particular class, what I did was 20% projects. So I gave them one day a week to kind of just I, I, four days a week, I focused on the things that I wanted to do and the things that are, you know, part of my syllabus and whatnot. But the the one day a week I give them that opportunity to work on something that they wanted to work on, um, and I had a, a handful of assignments that you know not so much choice boards per se, but I had a handful of assignments that they had to do as part of this nine weeks long project. Um, and one one thing that I would would ask would be or get asked is you know can we work with a partner or can we work with a group or something like that and. Um, my answer was always this, you know, I want everybody to do their own project and I want everybody to have their own responsibilities part of this project, but everybody has to have their own project. So what I meant by that was if you're someone who wants, you know, has an interest in robotics, um, I got these kits back here and, you know, one of you can work on the building and, and possibly the coding of this robot, but then somebody else if you want to pair up maybe you could design 3d print a an adapter to it um to to perform some certain task and somebody else can do like a, a video log um on the whole process of building and coding and designing this stuff and, and put it all together in a video um and, and there's i branched off in a lot of different ways but um, in the end, yes, it, on the surface, it looked like one big group project where three or four kids were working on building the robot, but they all had their own part of interest uh, within that process. Um, and, and I think that worked really well. And, and I did have, you know, one kids, one group of kids kind of take that on. Um, they used the GMU kit to, uh, and, and the one kid, 3D printed a mount for a GoPro so that the robot could walk around in that first person point of view and, and do a video. Um, right. So, you know, and then what happened was, you know, one kid saw the robots up and moving around and that sparked an interest there. So mm -hmm. when we kind of did it over again, someone else wanted to take on the, the coding part and the building part. Um, and it just kind of flowed out. Um, now with a couple of more kits, I, I can do larger group projects with that. Um, it, at first, it was really a resources thing for me because uh, like Paul and Warren said, time's not an issue for me. This is what I do. This is where it's expected to be done. Um, so finding different classes to integrate it into um, uh, it was just kind of natural, like I said with, earlier, with you know engineering and computer science principles, and um, you know other classes, you know, on a more a little bit more limited level. Those are the two that I, I really uh, am sticking with this year. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it, it's just kind of grown from there. So very cool. I love giving the kids not only the ownership but the all the choices, right? On I just love that Fridays are for them and and whatever they want to explore in their passions. And and Paul and Warren just they talked about that as well, right? Getting them excited and interested in what they want to learn about. I think that's fantastic. Exactly. Cool. And I think the and I, I think there's a lot of value in giving them choice in terms of how they explain their learning. But with those projects, I think it's just as valuable, not so much giving them the choice in how to display the learning, but giving them choice in what they want to learn about. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, the, I think it's the content that really grips them um, for any project. You know, if they're interested in the content, they're going to be interested in the project. And, you know, it, it kind of goes along with that moniker of um, choose a job you love and you never work a day in your life. And I, I kind of, with that particular project, I kind of enforce that same philosophy. I really stress that when we have downtime, this is what you should be, you should pick a topic that you want to work on, right? Because mm -hmm. you always have this project to work on in the background if you get done early or something else. Like pick something that you're that passionate about that you want to learn about. And, and a lot of kids have, and, you know, from that project, not just with the robotics, but I've had a lot of neat things come from kids just exploring their passions. Absolutely, I love that so much. And just to recap, right? So you could do choice boards, you could do extensions, you can do Fridays are for them, right? Letting them choose, giving them um, like the group activities or the stations, right? Like, so, so many different ways that you can, you can get robotics and STEM into your lessons without having to redo everything you do because it's hard. You gotta start somewhere and start small and then just build up from there. And it will just become natural once you switch to that mindset, right? Of, I don't need to know everything. The kids can do a lot of this on their own, like letting them branch out. So that's fantastic. Thank you guys. Okay, we are to our Q&A time. We do not have any Q&A in right now. We have no questions put in. So those that are on the call, please send in questions that you have for these three gentlemen with me. But I have a question for you guys that I just want you to ponder for a moment. I'm going to go to the next webinar slide, introduce that webinar, and then I'm going to come back. So the question I would like you to think about it is what is your favorite project you've done with students or what was your favorite like aha moment that you saw from a student? So favorite project or favorite aha moment. I'm going to skip to the next slide and then I'll come back and ask you guys that question again. Um, oh, and I forgot Paul put in some cool applications. I believe it was Paul. Is that right? Sorry, I made the assumption, <laughs> but we were talking about this on Twitter, I believe with um, I think it was Zoe and she's actually not on the call. She's normally on these webinars. So um, we have a Gmu robot that you can build an animal and one of them was a penguin. And so Paul had chimed in there with that teacher who posted about the students building their robotic penguin with some of these awesome robotic penguins as well. So it's a real life, real world, right? Experience. Um, so these are fantastic. Paul, do you wanna add anything about this slide? Uh, there are links there to the articles. Uh, I forget which magazine had those articles. Uh, but I remember seeing one of them from uh, Huey, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, they were talking about one of these um, robots. Okay, yeah. So if you guys have not um, looked at the Google Doc yet, there are tons of links in there for different projects and different um, software applications, just all sorts of different things that you should check out. So yes, there are lots of, lots of things in there and the turtle art and oh my gosh, so many fun things. So Yes, so here is another real world connection, right? You can make with your students and so many of the grade levels focus on animals, right? Life cycles, those types of things. So this is great. And our beginner kit and our GMU have a lot of animal builds as well. Okay, so I wanna tell you a little bit about next month's webinar and then I'm gonna go back to the Q&A and we have a question in um, for you guys as well. Oh, we got two questions in now. Okay, I gotta quit reading and focus. So next month we are doing um, utilizing robots to teach standards. Um, I believe we have another TAP teacher on board for that one. I don't remember. Is it any of you three by chance? No? Okay. <laughs> I don't remember who it is, but I'm pretty sure somebody's joining us for that. Um, so we're going to talk about how we connect standards and robots. Um, it is going to be recorded. So do know that it will be released on this day. Just it won't take up all your this hour like we normally do. So it will be recorded and then sent out um, for those that are signed up for that. So if you have not yet, please do. Um, Okay, let's go, let's see the back arrow here. Okay, we're gonna go back to q and 
I'm going to have the guys answer my question first, and then I've got two other questions for you guys, okay? So whoever wants to jump in first, what was the favorite project you've done with students or your favorite aha moment that they have had? Whoever went, oh, Warren raised his hand first. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> Go for it, Warren. What do you got? Sorry, I'm trying to unmute with the <laughs> wireless device here. Um, uh, sort of what I talked about earlier, uh, when my students were um, created a um, mass sanitation device, um, they used bits and pieces of a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? And uh, basically, COVID was took over the world. So everybody's pretty much home. Um, but uh, basically, um, the competition was still going on. They were still trying to see whether or not students can still do the, the research comp competition at, at their homes. Well, four students did. Um, the two of the parents went down that rabbit hole with me. And we, we found a way to uh, get those students to work together online and actually create a device. And um, I want to say before, before uh, we leave here, I think I can grab it. It doesn't work per se anymore, but it's, it's big and heavy, but I think I can roll it in uh, just so y'all can take a look at it real quick. Um, and they won first place with it. I thought that was one of the coolest things um, because we had two students to use, one student used UV lights to try to see how they can kill the, uh, any type of bacteria or stuff from the future dish. The other one used uh, some type of cleaning agent and the, the other two boys actually built the robot to actually put it, um, the, um, the mask in. And um, um, it, it actually, that was one of my, that was a hard feat. It was very difficult to do during the COVID year, but we pulled it off, they won state, uh, could have got regional, would have gotten three thousand. If they, if they went to the national, they would have got close to ten thousand. But that was their first one ever, and I was I was happy about that. And um, that was my uh, me personally. That was my impactful moment. It made me want to push harder and do more for my students. And that was that was last year. That was last year. So that was pretty cool. That's very cool. All right, if you want to run and go grab it, you're welcome to go see if you can roll it in, and we'll have the other guys answer. All right, Brian or Paul? I'm ready if, if you're- okay. Oh yeah, yeah, go for it. So uh, as of right now, I, like I said, watch, watching my engineering students and there was six groups of them, um, one, of, one of the six groups was just a single working, um, but uh, five other pairs and it was really awesome because it was just so uh, organic how they kind of handled their time and doing different things. Um, like I said, once they they had their robots built, it, it was nice because they just kept tweaking them. Um, you know, once again, one kit, one one pair just completely built it from scratch, um, and even then, it was okay, I wanted to be able to climb a book and the tracks aren't getting over the book. So he put, he took the little green connectors, which are the little small, tiny ones in, in the kits. And he put them, embedded them into the tracks, right? To give it something to lift up onto the book. Um, uh, another group, I, they took some of their downtime and at first I was kind of like, uh, maybe not once again, kind of being comfortable with the uncomfortable, but it almost kind of turned into like a battle bots type oh. of thing. But like I said, I was kind of leery to let them do it, but then it just sparked more, how can I make this better? Because I want to beat him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want to do something, you know, flip them over or, you know, just do something to win the battle. And it just kept sparking and, and more creativity and more different things and making sure that all of their, their codes were working right because the next day they're going to come in and they, they were going to try to battle again unless, you know, I had something a little bit more planned, more structured. Planned for them. But um, it was 
like I said, just so organic how thoughts were flowing from group to group to group. Um, even like, like I said, I had one single player and the, the, the one robot that he built was uh, a, um, the, the strobe, not necessarily a strobe light, but um, it, it, it was just kind of the oscillating light uh, build from the intermediate set. And he was trying to figure out what can I do? <laughs> and, you know, and he was trying to get it to move forward left and right and just kind of being around. And I, I think he wound up teaming with someone who built a truck. And, and, and like I said, the, just the organic nature of it was, was awesome. So I'll throw that one in there. That's perfect. It's always like the best feeling, right? When you're like, no, 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 I have to stop you. We have to move on to something else. Like we can't, yes. we can't keep exploring, but that's awesome. That's, that is just the excitement carries, right? And then everyone wants to keep doing it. So, very fun. All right, Paul, favorite project or favorite aha moment? Oh, uh, just, just too many of them. There's, <laughs> there's tons. When you, when you, when you get into to more to maker centered learning, idea there there's just constant um we start the we would start the year off in physics by making hovercrafts that they had to sit on and go and i got a hundred foot extension cord that goes past the wall and kids would run into the wall so at <laughs> least some why are you running into the wall there's got to be some physics here but um so I, I love you know doing things like that i mean we I mean, even just having one class, uh, bringing them, bringing wood in, and said, "Hey, you guys want to work outside? So we need to build a picnic table." Right. And how do we uh, figure it out? There's how you build. You know, uh, geometry class. We made uh, seven foot tall, two seven foot tall geodesic domes made out of PVC pipe. Um, so I mean, so they got to cut the PVC and figure out how to put it together, and then they had to market it. And they had to create a marketing plan, whether it would be a greenhouse or whether it would be a garden shed or a toy shed or um, rockets. I love doing uh, pop bottle rockets. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I just, let's love anything where we can make stuff and they can have fun and put their, their, their mark on it. And we can have discussions about lots of things, not just our topic. Right, for sure. Yeah, expand it out. And Paul, I'm going to have you, I'm going to let Warren share the project there, but then um, can we come back and do um, Marcus's question? Can you kind of sum up the answer that you gave to him? All right, Warren, tell us about your project. Okay, this will be real quick. Uh, basically, this is what a few seventh graders did. They're eighth graders now, and um, uh, they made a mass sanitation device. It doesn't we had to take some of it apart now because we had to use it for other, other projects later on. But basically, you would come here and you would press a button back here that's on the back, and the actual door will open up. Right. It actually comes all the way open. You drop your mask in, and then it'll close. Another device, this is where you have your spray. It'll come down, press the spray, because your mask is here. You put your mask right there. Actually, that's the old mask that we've been, it's probably just dead. Nobody wants to use this. We've been spraying it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, you spray that. And then at the same time, it's a timer that they programmed um, where it has a, a uh, simulated UV light back here. We will plug it up. And when it's done, the door will open up and you have your mask and be sanitized. And, uh, and you can see it, it has all the crazy wiring and stuff back here. That wow. the so yeah, it took, like I said, the research was done. One, one student had the UV light um, to do petri dishes to see how the bacteria, how long it would take. The other student used a sanitation spray to see uh, how much uh, the spray need, was needed, one spray, two spray, and then the amount to, with Petri dishes with their parents. Luckily, those, their parents were science teachers as well. So it, it, it made my job easier <laughs> So I try to do that. And so the, the other boys built this by themselves. So the only thing they had to do was program it to what the other students said, hey, we needed to stay in the light for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Hey, we need two sprays. 
program it to spray twice or something like that. And it worked beautifully, you know, and we were all virtual and we, we made it happen. So that, that was the cool thing about it. And um, some of it's a part now because um, we had to use it for other stuff. I just started, I took all the pictures I could take in video and uh, <laughs> this is the gist of it right there. That's very cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Okay, so Marcus um, is asking pretty much, right, limited budget. What can I get into my classroom robotics wise that's cost effective, don't have to spend a lot of money on, and the class can code it? So Paul put in a good answer. Paul, do you want to kind of sum that up? Where would you suggest teachers start if they don't have a lot of money, but they want to get into robotics and coding? Uh, I like, if you want something that's kind of multi- compatible. I like um, Edison, meet Edison. It's a little block robot that's got a couple of motors built in, some sensors, some LEDs. So you got a variety of things to code for inputs and outputs. Um, they're $50. And if you buy them in bulk, I think like if you get 10 for 350, so it gets on to $35 as a robot. Uh, but the even greater thing than the little bit that they have for, you know, $35, $50 is you can code them with icons for littles blocks for people you know middle school or with python and it's all browser based so any device can code it literally strangest thing it transfers code via sound so it's oh. actually a sound cord you plug in you plug into the mic to the the output on your device um, so maybe some of the newer MacBooks can't do that. Do the newer MacBooks have headphone jacks? Ooh, maybe not. Um, but if so, it would work on Chromebooks. I mean, that's the biggest thing to me. Because, um, the, I mean, the thing I, I hate with, I love coding in robotics. I love robotics because um, it's so much of the world. The tough part is if you want to get a kit where you can build stuff, mm -hmm. they cost money. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's my biggest complaint about all robotics is they cost and the, the least expensive I've seen where you can do some stuff is like the hummingbird robotics, uh, bird brain technology, their, their hummingbird kit. It's like a hundred, $120. Um, and it's got a couple of things in it and you can do some stuff. You can get started, but you're adding on cardboard, you're adding on popsicle sticks, you're adding on straws um, to build animals kind of thing. They, their favorite thing is the robot petting zoo. Um, right where you create little things, but that's the, the least expensive is like a hundred dollars to get you some components. And I've tried build, making my, making my own kits, um, you know, buying components in bulk and seeing how much you could get down to. And it, it, it's still, it's like a hundred bucks. Once you start adding, you got the pro, the micro, I was a micro bit. It was a, it was another control board, all the cables, some servos, some LEDs, um, some sensors, yeah, it, it, it just all just those components comes to like $100 a kit. For sure. Yeah. Brian Warren, do you guys have any suggestions for people that want to get started with robots on the cheap end? And it's okay if you don't. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I can say this. We are, we are medical magnet school. And yes, it's, it's difficult to get uh robots in especially to for for a whole program itself it takes time to build uh i started out here as a stem teacher and what i did was sort of what paul said i was using the popsicle sticks and the little strain and uh straws and stuff uh one of my one of my projects that kids liked at the time was creating a mechanical arm uh, you can find that online uh, one of the, a great website I think I got it from was uh, teachengineering.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's it. Um, I get a lot of projects from there. Um, uh, but you can you can start out that way. Um, start out with little toys that you can get. You know, from uh, I, was about, I was just about to say toys with us. That's old school. Okay, <laughs> now they, it's amazing. But you know, you just get little toys and stuff and. Mm -hmm. start start making your kits. Um, if you like little stuff like this, uh, I just started a, um, a nonprofit uh, to teach. Um, I just got a, uh, approved for that, you know, with the federal government to, to do a nonprofit to actually do STEM activities for um, uh, underrepresented youth. And uh, what I plan on doing is 
getting little stuff like that. And just like what Paul said, to try to alleviate that cost, man. We got to find a way. There are a bunch of stuff out there. People got some ideas. People got a lot of projects. Um, and that's that's what I plan on doing with the nonprofit is just making or finding these little kits just for classroom, classroom stuff. That's what teachers need so they can, like, man, help out with their pacing guide, help out with their testing. So it's just going to be straight lesson related, you know, that you can use that won't cost a lot. So, yeah, it's, it does take time. Uh, go to those places, those websites. I just saw what uh, there was on there was in the chat right there. A bunch of places where you can go and um, start with programming. Programming is good too. I uh, I do a lot of drill and practice. I had the kids actually create tests from those uh, programs. Um, and basically, what they do is make little games where they have questions that they get asked themselves. So that 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 works also. And um, uh, it just takes time. You get it. And I think uh, what you're doing, what everybody's doing here is getting ideas and just keep plugging in. And I think you'll be fine. Absolutely. Brian, you got anything to add in there? I, I didn't at first, but it really just kind of <laughs> hit me that um, I, I, and the one that popped in my head is uh, relevant to UB Tech. I'm sure there's other ones out there as well, but um, it may not be exactly what you're looking for, but if you go on the U-Code, uh, which is what we use to program with the UKIDS. Um, the, there is a section where there's virtual robots available. And you, yes, obviously you miss out on the uh, building aspect of those robots, but you completely get the coding aspect of it. Um, and you can use that block-based coding to, you know, use grayscale readings and uh ultrasonic stuff i mean there's uh, correct me if i'm wrong christina but it seems like there's a robot at least with every sensor that those kits offer mm -hmm. and they're all free um you know obviously the the physical kits aren't um but you know the you can get on on you code to you know see how that block-based coding works and you know work it within that virtual environment which is, which is also good if, you know, you only have a few kids and a whole bunch of kids um, because a lot of us, you know, tap teachers have, have talked about how the, the kids, you, you put much more than two people on it and it just kind of, it, it gets lost amongst the third wheel or someone inevitably kind of becomes, you know, just that tag along person or sips into the background. So it, that, that'd be another way to just bring more kids into a project, um, putting it, loading them into that virtual environment. Um, and, and like I said, you're still working on a lot of those same skills, but you just do miss out on that, that building aspect, which is right. a lot of what gra people gravitates kids, um, in my opinion, is just the building. That gets, gets them really interested, but if you just really want to focus on that coding, that, that is available. Yeah, for sure. And um, not to throw you all off, because I don't think any of you teach these grade levels, or oh, maybe the older part, but uh, Marcus has K-5. So he is, he's young kids. Um, so I would say my suggestion was what Brian said too. Um, coding, right? There's like code.org. All of those websites have some coding activities, picto blocks, you code, um, where you can do drag and drop coding with them to at least get them started. Um, the most cost-effective robot in my opinion for that grade level is going to be one where you don't have to build it you just program it which like brian said is not as much fun <laughs> you know they get bored after a while for coding it but uh you might just look at those robots where you just program as opposed to building um or you start with popsicle sticks and whatever else you can find and you go from there i mean it's kind of that's tough or and i can't believe none of you mentioned this but i also didn't explain tap earlier so our teacher ambassador program is how we have all three of these guys with us today, but you could look around at robotics companies and there are many out there, even STEM companies do some sort of teacher advisory group or teacher ambassador group. Um, and these guys all got some robots from us for that. So, I mean, if you're trying to stay really cost effective, start signing up for all the groups and <laughs> seeing what you can be a part of and maybe you can get some classroom sets that way. Um, we had one more question. Sorry, Tony, I don't think we're going to, um, well, I'll let you guys answer, but then we'll, We'll let people jump off if they want. So Tony's question for you guys was, 
do you ever get the robotics students involved in the community? And if so, how? So do you ever take them out of your classroom, get them involved with a company in the area or, or a business of some sort? So I'll let you think on that. Um, those people that are still with us, I'm gonna jump to this slide real quick. Um, just a recap of you can get to us um, through our social media, email, website. The webinar is, gonna, is recorded. We will send that to you and you'll also get a survey link that we would love for you to fill out. Let us know what you think. But we've got quite a few people still on. So any of you guys wanna answer real quick, how do you get your students involved with the community? I'll answer quick, I haven't done it yet. Okay, there you go, fair enough, that's fine. Yeah, and, and I'm, you know, little projects here and there with the robots that I have. Um, I, I guess community-wise, the one thing that, uh, that just kind of kicked with me is, uh, another teacher in our building, uh, our, our FCC LA teacher, she does a first grade cookie bake every year um, where the elementary kids in the first grade come over to the high school and there's a couple of different stations um, that they do in between the different phases of them baking cookies and coloring cookies and decorating them and all this sort of stuff. Well, um, they, they come down to my room and uh, I, I let them drive the robots around a little bit. You know, I, I had it pre-programmed and everything, but they, they drove it around and I, I had a couple functions built in there for uh, making the mover bot clap and uh, just different stuff to, to kind of give them a thrill. We also did, I had uh, the, the first year I did it, I had the idea that um, uh, we would do some Sphero bowling. Um, so I printed up some some bowling pins to scale to the little Sphero ball, and it, I just did it kind of as a driver and not nothing really coding based. But they they drove the Sphero ball to knock all the pins down. Um, so I mean, it's still within the school community uh, when, when those kids would come. So I, I haven't really branched out to to businesses or anything like that. Um, but one day, you know, once again, after, you know, this first year of, of working with UB Tech and, you know, doing different things, you know, the, the sky's the limit. So um, I would be open to suggestions on, on how to do that as well. Very cool. Warren, you want to add anything in? Yeah, yeah, this would be real quick. Uh, it's, it's not really with a business per se, but um, we have a school, an elementary school next door to us. And what I had some of my students to do, uh, they would demonstrate some of the robots over there uh, at the elementary school. Um, like I said, this was just before uh, COVID hit, and we just they just opened back up for other people to come this year. Uh, but what a cool thing about it, I know for a fact that they actually ordered some U kits <laughs> uh, last year uh, for that. I know they did, you know. So uh, whatever my students did. Uh, uh, it kind of inspired. Uh, I didn't sell anything. <laughs> I didn't sell. I was like, "Hey, this is what we're using," and, I, and it worked. And so they got different versions. But I know that the um, uh, the principal wanted me to come over there this summer to work with these students uh, with the U kids, uh, just to get them started. To teach the actual teacher uh, who will be doing the class next year. They say, yeah, Mr. Wise, we, we got him, we got him. You gonna come show us how to do it? I'm like, yeah, okay. And we just gotta schedule the time. But yes, uh, working with the students next door at the elementary school, um, uh, it, do, it does work. Uh, we haven't used it with a business just yet, um, but uh, we'll see how that goes in the near future. Very cool, very cool. All right, we do not have any other questions. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Thank you three for joining me so much. This was so much fun. Um, I very much enjoyed our first round table. And for those on the call, this is the first time we've done something like this. So if you have any feedback on what you'd like to see if we do it again, please let us know. You guys can turn in your feedback too if you wanna let me know, but thank you so much. We appreciate you guys coming. And remember next month's webinar is going to be a recorded one. So it won't be live. Um, but we will get that out to you guys if you have signed up. So thank you three so much. And we will see you guys all next month. Have a great rest of May.